So the the the, the, ob- the objects that are produced at this scale or at this resolution mm. are maybe not the whole of the of the of the original work. Was this is that possible? I mean, we were talking earlier with, with Fabian about mm. um, bandwidth in Devon. I mean, this this is the sort of topic which does come up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, the sort of scenario would be that an artist has a, a big digital file. Right. It's obviously a lot more backstory than that, but they've got a big digital file mm-hmm. and they upload it somewhere, and the host service says, "Oh dear, we'll never be able to serve this to our." mobile phones mm. and they do another version of it which is two inches tall and um, a, a very low res mm-hmm. and at that point um, the backstory is still there mm. but that could be produced on a larger scale is that, mm. is that a way of looking at it? Yeah, I mean yeah, I, 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 I personally quite enjoy GIFs GIF files which are those really small um, animation files you can get on the computer and I think yeah. It's a bit like the text message. It's an innovative way of using um, the small amount of bandwidth, I guess, you allowed on an image file. So I, d- I don't see why smaller bandwidths should be a limitation either. I think you can make use of it. I don't know if that answers the question for you. Well, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, 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 th- I think there's a, a, an issue here, which is that... Um, I don't know. My backstory is that I'm fed up with William Caxton, <laughs> who made everything 2D. Um, yes, okay, it might have been some 700 years ago or something, but um, yeah, know. the photography has <laughs> has been played with so much now with with um, Photoshop and everything else that we are so used to perfection. And if you see a paint catalog in in a local hardware store, you'll see um, color images of, of rooms with um, showing. Uh, the, the, the particular paints on walls and things if you look closely you'll see that that is such an artificial scenario because mm. the photographer has been let loose with lighting colour filters and everything else that it's actually no longer representative of the real situation and I think if we can cut back and deal with the raw reality of what actually you see I think it's a good thing and the state of the 3D printers um, just, just as Nick says um, it, it, it you go down to GIF files, um, they, they are, they take you to this raw essence of, of it all, and therefore you, there's room for you to appreciate more of what's going on, what the backstory is, more about the aura and the, the history of what it is you're looking at. So that, that's um, a, a side benefit. Um, but interestingly, um, the, the 3D printers are going to get more sophisticated. Uh, you'll be finding out that you will be able to print in colour that um, the machines that were used for this exhibition are um, very good, but they aren't extremely accurate. They're good enough. Um, and you'll find that a lot of the items in the show are actually just extruded two dimensions. There are some items there which are just two dimensions, and that's not the fault of the printing, the 3D printing. It's because the software uh, that the artists are using is, is quite difficult to engage with, and so they've used some um, two, basically two-dimensional. They, they've taken the, the easy route of just dealing in two dimensions. That's a couple of items. I, I took that route. <laughs> you did? <laughs> <laughs> uh, purely from a practical but, but point isn't, of view. But isn't that good? Because it means you can get onto the purpose of the exhibition, which is to see what you can do with the 3D printers. Well, mm-hmm. just, mm-hmm. Say, say a bit more about how you... Because you, you started with a font, which mm-hmm. obviously is 2D. Yeah, yeah. But you didn't start with metal, bits of metal, did you? The no, I, I wanted... I wanted to... The way I approached the commission was I thought, this is a great opportunity to use something I probably won't get to use again. So... Um, I thought I'll try and fit it into my practice as it already stands, and I thought that the the font could become quite authoritative looking, or it's a good presentation piece if it becomes in 3D as well as in 2D. And then it also developed because how would Tetris be if it actually was in real life? And then it can be, you know, dropping all over the place and gravity taking hold. So it was it became a work of its own, but it was purely through thinking this is a great opportunity, really. I just thought I need to use it well. I, I, I could have gone down the route of trying to explore with it, but I didn't feel I had the time to do that justice either. So I, I took a very practical route, personally. So you started with a 2D font, 
Mm-hmm. And how did you then make that into 3D? Yeah, it was it was in Google SketchUp, um, which is like Microsoft Paint, I guess, in 3D software <laughs> terms, um, and built it up plane by plane by plane, which was just making a cube, pushing and pulling it in and out to make the the indents of the Tetris shapes, building each cube up to make each Tetris shape, saving that file. So there's, there's a few saving points. Then once you've got the Tetris shape, save that as a separate shape, make all the different shapes, then compose the letter. So it was, it was quite pragmatic and methodical. And it was a way for me to structure the commission into the, the printing that I have to do for print screen press because it's quite a busy haphazard, um, or it has been haphazard approach to printing that I've had to make that structured project. So that's how that became what it was. Right. Yeah. It, I think it was it was a different way to approaching it than a lot of people. There was there was guys up there that used SketchUp. They pushed it to its absolute limits. I thought there was there's the the building by Stephen Monger, which is unbelievable. I, how he used SketchUp in that way, I have no, <laughs> no idea at all. So. SketchUp Pro. Yeah, oh. he, he is a SketchUp Pro. Or well, it was no, he has Pro. The, the software upgrade. Oh know. right. So really? just just oh. just to explain, I, I think I've got this right. That SketchUp, there is a free version of it that anybody could download and get an idea of what's possible. And then there's more expensive versions. Oh. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, versions that and you, you have more functionality, as they call it. Yeah, so you can, you've got more scope. I'm guessing that he is SketchUp Pro, or he is very clever. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. No, my brother, my twin brother's an architect, and he uses SketchUp uh, Pro quite often to do funny bits, which um, he can't do in the normal architect's package. He dips sideways into SketchUp Pro, makes up a piece, and then inserts it, just like we were talking earlier about um, uh, designing items to go into virtual reality. Right. Okay. Well, I think we should have a have another chat of music. And uh, come 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 back to the the, the, the items in the neo replicant show on on the next next uh, talk section. Okay, shall, shall we move on to Manu Chao? Oh, nice. And we've got um, Manu Chao um, <laughs> clandestino. And when when the Manu, Manu Chao were uh, one of the first bands, one of the early bands that came into play when uh, the record companies <laughs> and the record stores started talking about world music, which meant. They were trying to legitimise the fact they were giving up their top 20 and, and move into other music as well. So, Clandestino is, is I think, a scar background, and um, here we go. Mm-hmm. 